here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of the uh, New York No Wave Groove Dance Band. It is Liquid Liquid, because I recently spoke to their lead vocalist, singer and frontman. It is Sal Principato to find out more about life, love, poetry and all that other kind of groovy stuff. So anyway, this is the interview. After several minutes of casual chat, we got down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. I know it's a classic. And um, there are, I think, once or twice in the interview, the reception does get a little bit tricky, but um, it's generally okay. But um, apologies for that. I know. Anyway, Sal, it's over to you. Well, I, I think it was more like I had an artistic awakening, you know, uh, you know, I, I was a pretty uh, sheltered kid, kind of. My, my dad was a cop and, uh, you know, they didn't allow much into, <laughs> you know, much riffraff things into my life. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I kind of at, at a certain point, you know, being solidly working class and not really knowing, um, excuse me a second, not really knowing how I fit into all this. You know, it just it was just like a a, a a general artistic awakening that may turn me on to literature, turn me on to music, um, turn me on to movies and books and everything else. So it all kind of all happened at once when I was about 15 years old, 16 really? years old. And, and then it evolved, you know, I mean, the punk rock thing, Patti Smith, you know, when, when I heard horses, you know, it was like it gave me permission to be myself, you know, yes. and um and you know, just all, all anything, anything we could get our hands on, anything I could get my hands on, I was kind of interested. You know, got into dub reggae, um, things like that. So um, yeah, that was kind of in the in the mid seventies. You know, I started uh, you know coming on my own as an artist, and just because of punk rock, I was I always um, fancied myself to be a writer, a poet. And, and I did write a, a, a bit of poetry and stuff, but during, you know, the, the punk rock era, you know, anybody who, like in New York in the late seventies, not even, you know, a, a, everywhere in the States, I guess, anybody, maybe in the UK too, anybody who was doing any kind of art also had a band. And yes. um, do you want me to go on? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, could, you could interrupt me because I could talk. Um, <laughs> But I went out at a certain point, you know, uh, we're all, uh, Liquid Liquid, we're all from uh, New Jersey, and they all went to Rutgers. And I just, I didn't go to university at all. And I just needed to really get away. So I, I went, I knew someone in San Francisco, and I, I went to San Francisco, and I ended up uh, staying there for two years. And when I arrived, it's just when the punk scene there was like exploding. So it was really fun and nice and all. And I started, we started writing songs with Richard, the bass player from Liquid Liquid's brother, William, because he mm -hmm. was living there too. So that's, you know, how I started playing music. You know, I just, we just started writing songs and then I'll, I'll wrap this up shortly. And then <clears throat> I was just coming back for like a two week vacation in New York. And those guys, um, Scotty, the drummer and Richard, the bass player had graduated from Rutgers and moved to Manhattan. And I was going to go stay with them. And it was like, they were, they were making music. I was writing songs. They were like, you know, we just started practicing and it was like, made a little cassette tape, took it to Hilly at CBGB's and, and never went back to San Francisco. And that was the start of it all. As far as me playing music, me being in a band. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's quite exciting. Cause it's interesting. You, you've had a slightly, yeah. So you're, you're, cause often, you know, parents have a bit of a, an influence on people, either they weren't into music or they were quite hip to the trip and they were kind of kind of turned on to quite a lot of this stuff, but your childhood was much more, I think Jarbo from the Swans, I think her dad was in the, the law enforcement world. So that was a little bit of a tricky one when she wanted to do her artistic world. So you were you particularly sheltered at this stage or were you just kind of well, I, I, I wouldn't say I mean yes sheltered but it was like suffocated with everything including love. You know, I mean I just, you know, they you know my my dad was my dad, you know, we were talking about the 60s and 70s, you know, I mean you know, he was just a tip, you know, a, a, you know, he was, he was fun, but he was also tough. And my mom was just incredible because I had major ADD, you know, 
That's why I never did good in school. Couldn't. It's just when I started, um, you know, frankly, when I started doing drugs, it helped, uh, like including speed and marijuana, amphetamines and marijuana, um, that I was able to concentrate and focus and look at look at life around me and say, "Whoa, you know, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't get it, but I know which I know where I have to start going." And that's when I started reading uh, vociferously. Um, you know, I didn't want to, you know, since I did really bad in school, I was I was pretty ill informed, you know, and, you know, I didn't want to be that. So, you know, I, like for years, for like 20 years, I would read two, three hours a day just to get up to speed. And I'm still getting up to speed. You know, I'm still looking up words when I read a, a New Yorker article. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But like I, I sheltered was a, is a funny way I put it, but I guess it. Generally, you say sheltered, you're, you know, away in some kind of upper middle class, rich people's, uh, you know, place where you're not really seeing things. I saw things all the time. I just couldn't participate in them. Yeah, absolutely. And did I, you I, catch? I don't know. I, don't know. You, I was going to say, yeah. were you? Did you catch that tail end of the '60s, or did you? Were you aware of it within your household at this stage? Well, I, I I really like in like in the early seventies when I was really young, I was kind of a deadhead, and for a couple of years, and I was really disappointed that I missed the sixties because I was you know I really liked the, like in the early seventies when, when it was all over, you know, uh, you know I really liked you know I loved Woodstock and all of that and all and Bob Dylan and you know you know I was just way into it, um, but yeah, so I was kind of informed by the 60s but again it was more of a broader cultural thing you know like the revolution you know i like you know the the revolutionary spirit you know the utopian visions that's what i was kind of into you know but then it was perfect when punk rock came along because you know i was kind of uh, like a hippie or aspiring i was ne never really anything you know that you could put your finger on but like you know it just wasn't working you know by like 74 75 you know, the 60s just didn't make any sense, but I wasn't seeing anything else, you know, and it took me a little while, you know, to, to like, like I said, Patti Smith was a, a big influence and stuff. And um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, that's did you, happened. did you, did, did what, what, what did you make of bands like the Eagles or Fleetwood Mac or any of those kind of slightly grown I, up I, bands? I, I, like it's really. Sorry, <laughs> I should let you finish. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Time. Just get far away. Um, so I would say, well, in retrospect, I have a totally different view of that stuff now, but at the time it was just, you know, it wasn't revolutionary. It wasn't trying, I, I, I looked at it just like, like music, you know, not music for music's sake, but music just to, you know, impress someone or make money. It just didn't seem to have any real purpose behind it, you know? Um, now I could just really admire the craft. Yes. Of it, you know, like, you know, but like in the 70s, mm -mm, you know, like, you know, I, you know, I want, I wanted like, you know, I wanted something that was really, really, really artistically ambitious, hopefully without being too indulgent, self-indulgent, you know? So, um, you know, and then, you know, when I was listening to even things like Velvet Underground and Iggy Pop, um, Fela, when we discovered Fela, which was really, really weird. It was like about 1974. We used to hang out with uh, my buddy who I went to high school with in his room because you could smoke in there and smoke weed and everything. And somehow he came up with a Fela record, you know, and it was like, you know, zombie. And it was like, oh, my God, it, was, it just seemed to be a, a message from, you know, the stars, the heavens, you know, it, it, was, it just blew my mind. Like, you know, and, that, and that's what I wanted music to be, Fela, you know, uh, you know, political, spiritual, musical, radical. Got it. Now, interestingly, I've never heard of Fela. What is, is that the name of the band? God, I shouldn't have to admit this, but what the hell? No, that's okay. Well. Firstly, I want you write this down. I want you to go on YouTube. I I'm think going it's still to. on there. Yes. And they um like uh, it was I think it was a co-British and French documentary on him done in the early eighties, just pretty much when he was really hot and uh, you know at his uh, height of his powers. 
and it's called Music is the Weapon. Fela Kuti is his full name, Fela Anakalapu Kuti, F-E-L-A-K-U-T-I. Um, and it's called Music is the Weapon. It's, you can probably watch it in parts. And if you can't get it on YouTube, just find it because it's amazing. You know, I've seen it a hundred times and uh, it really shows you who he is. He's the guy who invented Afrobeat. Right. Um, uh, and he had this club in Lagos called The Shrine. And it tells you all this in the thing. It's just, you know, it, it just is amazing. I mean, he also was very eccentric and very reactionary. And especially as he got older, he he died of AIDS in like 97. Um, I, I don't want to have to give you a backstory, but, you know, Fela is a Nigerian musician from the 70s who, um, you know, very much influenced by James Brown. And but also, you know, traditional Yoruba and whatever uh, rhythms and stuff. Amazing. Yes, it was. A, it would have been 10, well, not 10 years, but in the mid 80s, we had a DJ called John Peel, who, um, he was just of brilliant. He, he was kind of, you know, evening, nighttime radio on, you know, BBC and Radio One. And um, he introduced, you know, it was kind of that was my decade, the 80s. So he introduced me to a lot of the indie stuff. But he also introduced me to all the kind of African bands at that time, like the Bundu Boys and the Four Brothers and Thomas McFumo and the Blacks Unlimited. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, the 80s was just a very exciting period, actually. So um, that was good. So sorry, there's a bit of a crackle there, actually. Um, yeah, so that was that was kind of an exciting thing. But I haven't come across much on the 70s kind of African music. I think reggae-wise, there was people like Augustus Pablo and Dennis no, I mean, Brown. Yeah, Augustus Pablo, huge, huge influence. Like, you know, uh, yeah, what is, it, what is it called? Rockers. What's the name up, that? Uptown, with, with King Tubby, isn't it? Um, Rockers Uptown no, yeah. or something. Well, I, I just love him, and I, and I had the pleasure of seeing him in New York in like '86, I think it was. Yes, but yeah, Cause I, like because I was going to say I had an older brother who was seven years older, and he it's the '70s for him was prog rock. It was you know it was the you know Je Genesis, Yes, Wishbone Ash, Barclay James Harvest, and and also a bit of heavy metal like um, Deep Purple and Black Sabbath. Did it did any did any of that sort of cross into your consciousness at all? Yeah, but that's when I was really young, you know. Uh, you know, when I was like 14 years old or something like that. Um, yeah, Black Sabbath. I mean, you know, like I, I shouldn't talk about my drug use so much, but like I remember, you know, in high school um, doing this thing that we it was a pill called THC. We called it THC, which is, of course, the psychoactive thing, marijuana. But I think it was just horse tranquilizers. So, I, you know, we would do this and you would just be completely, you know, in, incapacitated you know you just could only lay on the ground or like you know kind of mumble or something and I remember listening to uh Black Sabbath laying on skipping school laying on someone's floor and listening to Black Sabbath the electric funeral record right uh yeah yeah so that was but I was super young and then you know my mother tried to get me into painting so I was in the basement doing little paintings and stuff like that and um I remember listening to um, down over the edge, down by the river. Come from, you know, yes, <laughs> that, that yes record over and over and over and over. But that quick, quickly got tired. And, you know, again, you know, I wanted something, to, you know, I mean, I saw I saw Emerson, Lake and Palmer in like 73. Um, yeah, you know, it was. But that's when I was really young before that period of um, really discovery of where what direction I wanted to go artistically and not only. Me, me as an individual, but what I was accessing and appreciating. Yes. And did you also consume a lot of those movies that we loved in the 70s, like the Godfather films and, I don't know, The French Connection and Taxi Drivers and Mean Streets? Were they were they sort of coming into your kind of world, alternative, not alternative, but, you know, quite arty films? Um, I just wondered if you were yeah, also... Yeah, but I mean, I guess they Sure, definitely. Not, but even artier films, you know. I mean, there was a time, I mean, this is getting a little later on, um, like in the early 80s, I would just go to the library and see like 16 millimeter with homeless people and old people and watch these 16 millimeter like uh, Japanese uh, drawing room dramas, you know, just I, I was just consuming anything I could get my hands on. But like, yeah, I mean, you know, everybody saw The Godfather. I, I saw a racer head at, you know, min, at the midnight movies. I saw Rocky Horror Picture Show at the midnight movies, you know, when, when I was pretty young. I saw a double bill 
at the drive-in when I was fairly young of 200 motels in Barbarella. You right. can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a classic one, actually. So when did you get to leave home? Because the leaving home, especially in my day, was quite a big thing. It was like a rite of passage, wasn't it? Kids nowadays don't seem to want to leave home, which is probably fair enough. But I, I left home... I, we were you know leaving home with you know was kind of like that's it I've, I've kind of escaped the parents you know and i've escaped the family home so how old were you well, I, I left as soon as i can when i was 18 because if i tried to leave before i was 18 my 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 pop the cop wouldn't have it you know he would have hunt, hunted me down i mean that he's actually was a really fun guy you know he was a good guy but you know he had an edge to him but anyway i had to wait till i was 18 and you know, uh, you know, at that point, I was totally off in my own world, you know, and, and which probably was, you know, it pissed my father off and it probably hurt my mother, you know, like, you know, you don't want to have anything to do with anything, you know, anything that we try to our values or anything. And I did really roundly reject them pretty seriously. So I moved out, you know, the, uh, two days after my 18th birthday, which is as soon as possible. But, you know, it was really hard, you know, because I had no skills and you know, everybody else seemed to be doing all right, going to school, whatever, whatever. And that's why I took off to San Francisco. It was the farthest place I can imagine going away from where I was brought up. And it yes. really did help. It, re it really did help in a way that, um, you know, the East Coast is much more dense, you know, there's, you know, much more coming at you, you know, when I went out there, I had the space to like, you know, figure myself out, you know, feel myself, you know, not I wasn't, I wasn't put upon, you know, and, you know, it just showed me another way of being. And it's really ironic because, um, you know, like I says, I was into the San Francisco 60s scene for, for a bit. But when I was living there, I was totally not into <laughs> the 60s scene, even though I used to live in the Richmond up by the cliffs, up by the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and I would go to the cliffs and smoke a joint and write poetry. And the Jefferson Starship, uh, what's his name? Um, Paul Kantner had a house, and I would listen to the Jefferson Starship um, practice, which was always fun. Excellent. And, um, but like it, even this, this is a nice, even, uh, interesting thing. So this is like 1977, and the Rolling, Rolling Stone magazine did a cover of, of like you know of ten years after the Summer of Love, and it was like what a, it, the, the headline was: "What a long, strange trip it's been." And had all like, you know, Jefferson Airplane, Dead, Quicksilver, had all the stars of the 60s San Francisco. And it just seemed like a whole different universe that had nothing to do what was going on, you know, at the moment. So that's really interesting. And that's only 10 years. Now, you look at it now. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not as culturally uh, exploratory as much I am in a way, but not like when I was young. But like now, like 30 years ago, seems like, now almost to me i don't know I mean, that, i'm not articulating that too well but like it seemed like 10 years you know was a, a really long time ago and it seems like also like elvis and their original rock and roll which we were way into too you know that seemed like you know well that seemed relevant to the present in 1977 Yes, well, it's interesting with Elvis because I think he died seventy seven, didn't he? And um, he wasn't that old either. And then I was realizing in the sixties when he looked like he was so past it. It's like Elvis, you weren't past it at all. It was so strange because you're just thinking, yeah, you know, you were just very young, but somehow culturally you were just so off the off the sort of radar or off that kind of vibe that everybody else. I suppose it was that zeitgeist pe period of the sixties. And I often thought. You know, that kind of transformation between that sort of summer of love period of 67, which was obviously quite huge, and then sort of the, that kind of late 60s and you'd had sort of, you know, Woodstock, which which on, on some levels was a bit of a disaster, I think, for anybody who was there because it was so badly organised, but it filmed really well. But then you had Charles Manson, and then to just finish it off, you had the death of, you know, Morrison, J Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and you just thought, God, the, si the 60s kind of finished so badly, didn't it, really? You know, as as parties go, it, it was kind of not good. So um, I was just, um, yeah, I could imagine it must have been very strange for those guys to sort of try to be relevant in the next decade. Well, I think they were kind of commercial. I mean, uh, of course, the Grateful Dead kept going and going and going. And yeah, I just, you know, the Jefferson Starship became like, 
only you believe, you know, they, they came, became pop balladeers and stuff. But, you know, I mean, you know, they've been through it, you know. So, uh, you know, and now, and from my point of view now, I mean, they could have done whatever they wanted. And, you know, they must have been completely burned out after the 60s because, you know, the 60s were very, very, very intense. And, um, yeah, I mean, I can't think of anybody, well, to some, all right, there's a, there's a couple of things about Elvis. Firstly, let's get back to Elvis. Um, yes. You know about Elvis's 1968 television special, which is his comeback, where he kind of played in a, a almost like, looks like a boxing ring, surrounded by, like, you know, women, like, looking at him, and he was dressed all in leather, and he played with his original band. And it, it was, that, that's fabulous. That was fabulous. Yeah. And then going on to his, his uh, like, Las Vegas period, which, you know, that, that kind of brought him down. I mean, it was him going after he came out of the army. He totally changed from his original, you know, uh, like uh, approach. You know, that's when he made all the movies and stuff, which now in retrospect are kind of fun. Um, but then, you know, I guess uh, Colonel Parker like tried to lead him in that kind of Vegas direction, and then he did that '68 thing just to make prove he's relevant. And he sure was. But let me say, I forget what the documentary is called. It's like you know, Elvis something something or another. And there's footage from him, like one of his last shows, and he's just like puffy, bloated, you know, um, you know, um, you know, a little bit incoherent, but there's something underneath that that, you know, layer of 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 whatever, you still see his essence. And he had it right till the end, you know? Yes. And um so, you know, he's a true artist. He was. He was. And I, and I don't know if you saw that film, you know, the Baz Luhrmann film about Elvis. And I think that was frozen. the, there was like, um, am I frozen? No, you're frozen. Oh, God. Let me just just stop this for a second again. Yeah. So did you see the, I'm just picking that up. Did you see the Baz Luhrmann film? Because that bit where he's at the very end of that last ever concert and that guy's there sort of holding the microphone was kind of orig the original footage. It wasn't the actor playing Elvis at that stage. Right. What, which, what, which film was this? This is the Baz Luhrmann film that came out in the summer, I think, you know, the, the, the kind no. of the, oh, oh no, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah, I know about it. It is quite emotional. Is it yes. It? it is absolutely brilliant. It is a really amazing film. And I think it's really well done. But it was kind of interesting because I did, because one day, you know, doing this show, I thought, God, Elvis Presley, I must try and find somebody who played with Elvis. And I kind of found one of the singers who'd been in the Las Vegas kind of residence, residence, um, Terry, I can't remember his name, but he was one of those kind of Christian singers. And he talked about this kind of period with Elvis during Las Vegas. And it sounded quite amazing, but they kind of, what, you know. What did he say? That we could sum it up. Well, he said it was just brilliant and Elvis just loved being with them and they had a great time. But as that kind of Christian rock band or that they were, Colonel just wanted them to be part of Elvis and only work a little bit, you know, like during the year and then the rest of the time not work. And they said, no, we want to do our own thing all the time. So they left him. But they, you know, he just, you know, he was very committed to the to working with Elvis and just had a really amazing time in Vegas with him. So, um, and he said the band was amazing. The, it, you know, they, the experience they had was amazing. So um, it was interesting, you know, hearing somebody who'd worked with Elvis. It was just one of those yeah, things. for sure. It, it must be, it must be good. But yeah, the, the seventies, I think with any, with any kind of band, you know, they, you know, they have a sort of, a, a sort of quite a short zeitgeist moment if they make it. And then to trying to keep that going in the next one, because last night I did an interview with a guy from that Petrol Emotion and it was like, you know, they did, I think, five or six albums. And it was like he said it was amazing. You know, they you know, they they got a lot of publicity. They got a lot of good press. You know, they, they, the venues got a bit bigger. But then in the last couple of albums, the last one, you know, they only had a little kind of review in all the papers and the venues had got smaller and the crowds had even got smaller. Oh. And it was like, actually there's no one wants us anymore. So there you go. That, that's when they decide that was enough. So um, it is difficult to keep it going. That's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, you can't, you can't beat that dead horse for sure, you know. But <laughs> I, like, just to address what you were saying about, yeah, they have that zeitgeist moment. They, they, you know, they just, you know, viscerally, you know, understand what's going on and how to put it out there. You know, it's really hard. You know, I, like, I don't know what to think about that. Like, you know, as a musician, as anything, 
I mean, after you've made your artistic statement in any medium, do you stick with it just because that's what you do or you need the money or whatever, whatever? I mean, very few people, that's what I was before, just before the fro uh, we froze. I was thinking of like, is there anybody who's been relevant in the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever, you know, 90s? I mean, who keeps it going? I mean, people tried like Bob Dylan, you know, like he went, he didn't do, I mean, he went from, you know, in the 70s, Blood on the Tracks is just a, a masterpiece, yes. you know, and it was done, you know, he didn't do anything, ma even though he made, when I paint my masterpiece, between like, you know, the 66 and, and whenever uh, Blood on the Tracks came out. Um, but I don't think people should try it. I like the idea of like uh, older musicians, singers, whatever, like doing other people's work. They should have, they should do cover versions or they should have other people write for them. And that's probably the way to go because you can't keep up that vital artistic dynamic like for decades on end. Yes. But then, as I mentioned, possibly you might kind of remember, David Bowie was kind of fascinating because he, becoming so obsessed with David Bowie and then sort of kind of following his career. You know, he has his 60s work, which is kind of pretty hit and miss. Then his 70s is like he starts to get it together for various reasons with really good musicians around him. And he does like one album a year for the whole decade. And he produces Lou Reed at e Pop. He relocates. He does lots of world tours. You know, he gets married, he gets divorced, he has a baby child. You know, that's pretty amazing. Then he slightly does his 80s thing, which is a bit hit and miss. And then he finishes with Tim Machine. Then he does another project in the 90s. And then he sort of gets into the next decade. And then he unfortunately has his heart attack. And then reappears again with two more albums and finishes with Black Star. So Bowie is one of those interesting characters that somehow kept it somehow going which i think is quite boggling because because the rolling stones didn't you know the the solo work of paul mccartney is not really going to rock your boat after band on the run so it's kind of interesting that there is only one or two people who might have done that in their life but not many right well i um i saw this uh concert of bowie's it was not long before his death and I like I, you know, all due respect and everything. It was just um, I don't know where it was. I think I, I might have been, you know, uh, abroad when I saw it. I was just in a hotel watching TV, and it was on. And it it struck me. I, it was a little sad, really. Like it was a very small audience. Like I don't know, maybe that was totally intentional, but it just seemed a little off, you know. Like like there was no vitality there, and. Uh, maybe, you know, I, I'm not saying that's where he was at or whatever, but like, I think, you know, you got to, it is hit and miss. And also another thing, just to ramble on right now, I'm reading a New Yorker article about, um, uh, well, how come I'm spacing, spacing out on the uh, heavy metal, uh, who, who are they? They're still going, uh, guns and roses. Yeah. No, no, no. They're, they're um, more like death metal kind of thing, and and there's they're 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 American. Oh shit! Anyway, I'll I'll come back. To that. <laughs> I hope you're editing this. Wait. No, that? that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say the New Yorker. So so it's like Mega Death or um, does it begin with M? This is the main thing. I've got. I, I can I can try and Metallica. find Metallica. Metallica. Oh yeah, God, that is a bit tragic, actually, isn't it? Sorry if anybody loves Metallica. But they're still got, you know, but they, you know, this is this New Yorker article is very upbeat, but they are doing their set is all their old stuff. You know, even though they're still putting out albums, um their, their material. And you know, the the writer was just just went to see him in Las Vegas, ironically. And he said people were just ecstatic, you know. And yes. that's what I think that's the most important thing. If you could still bring that ecstasy to people. It's even more important than keep putting out new stuff that when you perform, you could still, you know, give people a transcendental experience. Yes, absolutely. So look, going back to your your sort of your your sort of career. So about 76, 77, you know, punk is here. And in do you feel that the punk scene in New York, America is very different to the punk scene in London or in, in England? Because because what I've noticed doing so many interviews with American people, there, there's kind of a lot more diversity, especially in New York with 
the sound is quite different. You know, there's a lot more experimentation. There's a lot more artiness. There's a there's a sort of psychobilly scene, isn't there, with people like the Rockettes and the, then the Cramps mm. and then the Stray Cats as well. And then you've got Suicide and you've got that electronic scene. And then you have all the Andy Warhol people and Basquiat. And then, you know, like this sound, which is very different to that kind of pub rock sound of punk in the UK. And punk quickly gets quite blokey in the UK, doesn't it? Even though there are one or two quite interesting other characters it's the party kind of gets quite poor but but in new york it does seem a little bit more quirky and a little bit more interesting well the umbrella is uh larger and broader but still you now i would say just like the summer of love the hippie whatever the punk movement lasted two or three years you know by 1979 it was like you know, I, I would, I, you know, I was not interested at all in in the raw punk stuff. You know, even like the Ramones, you know, who were like so vital in the mid seventies. You know, by by the end of the decade, you know, it was it was a bit over. You know, I mean, even though, you know, you can always be introduced to new generations, and that's something that's very um, important. But like, as far as being relevant in in, in a in a, a general sense, like you, you know, something especially something like punk which was based on a lot of attitude you know a lot of posturing you know that stuff just gets tired you know i mean you, you have to move on and yes. the thing about new york well you know think about new york we had in the mix disco and hip-hop so that like kind of steered things you know around a little you know in, in the late 70s uh, especially the early 80s so i mean you know it wasn't, you know, we weren't, I mean, not to say they are in London, one trick ponies, but even like I was saying about the San Francisco, California, LA, San Francisco punk scene, it was very different than, you know, it was probably more like the UK punk scene than uh, the New York punk scene. Um, but yeah, it, they all have their own flavor and their own, you know, little accents and stuff. So when did you relocate from San Francisco to New York in the 70s? 1979. 1979 this was there and did you I mean just to get an idea had because you did slightly mention but I kind of can't quite remember did the were the band already slightly formed or did you all come together as kind of four p different people well, then the narrative goes so at Rutgers they went to you know all my homeboys went to Rutgers you know Richard well Richard me and Richard the bass player of Liquid Liquid, were born in the same hospital six days apart in 1957. And, um, you know, and we, we became friends as teenagers. But anyway, he went to Rutgers, you know, and, and I, I, Rutgers is in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I lived there for a bit. And we started a performance group called the Lurkus Magnus, which was just this art, you know, con uh, conglomeration of, uh, you know, artiness. And, you know, I, I like, we played music within it. Uh, the first music I ever played was within the, the theme song of Alercus Magnus. So we had that, but then I went to San Francisco. Then they formed Liquid Idiot, which was just like a, a an extension of a, like a performance group, but it, it was strictly musical. It was totally improvisational. There's a seven inch of, of a Liquid Idiot out. And that's, Scotty was part of that, the drummer. And Dennis, the marimba player. When those, when Scotty and Richard moved to New York, we we did a gig with a bunch of people, but then we were just a trio, kind of doing, you know, transitioning from like kind of we never could pull off punk music properly. You know, it always sounded like something else other than punk. But you know, that's even why the name was changed because Liquid Idiot sounded too punk, and. Uh, you know, we did the gig in CBGBs and we just kept going. And uh, and then Dennis Young on marimba and percussion, he just joined the band. And then it was four of us. And, you know, we just took it from there. Yes. And, and, do, and then and we, in 19... I was going to say, were you kind of part of a, a scene at, the, at that stage? Did you feel part of a community? That's funny. No, not at all. I mean, we had friends like Conk and Dog Eat Dog. And, um, you know, we, we really appreciated other people's music, but, uh, you know, I did not at all. I mean, that's why I think we were considered a little more obscure back then because we weren't part of the scene. We weren't 
styling. We weren't posing. We were just like digging in deep to what we were doing. And, and uh, certain people really loved it, but certain people were like, I don't, I don't know what this is about. And, um, you know, like there used to be a newspaper called uh, the New York Rocker or the East Coast Rocker or something. And uh, uh, a writer reviewing our second album said, liquid, liquid, when no a song wouldn't know a song if it chased them down St. Mark's place, which is really a snarky thing to say about this, meaning that like we're not doing chorus verse, chorus verse, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever. So you know, it was it, it was um yeah, but as far as being a, a part of a scene, no. And it and after a while, I stopped listening to even people that could be associated with us because I didn't want it to unduly influence me. Because when you talk about big bands like Talking Heads and Pill, they have an idea. They could put something out in two months. Yeah. You know, we're with, we're with 99 Records, the independent label. It took us forever to, to, to come out with stuff, even though we, we had the idea like three years ago, you know? So I just, you know, I, I, like I just, um, I, I felt very insular. I, th I thought we were just, you know, we were just doing what we were doing. And, you know, that was the important. And what we're, we're just doing what we do. And that and what we're doing is important. I did have that feeling, you know. Yes. An artistic tip. So you signed to was it ninety nine, ninety nine record the record label ninety nine, didn't you? Yes. Was that was that quite straightforward? Did that sort of fall on fall into your path quite easily? Uh, yeah, it was pretty smooth. It was not like anybody was looking for us. We went looking for ninety nine records, you know, because we liked you know what like the Bush Tetras and ESG. And, um, you know, we just bought Ed Bauman, the founder, one of our cassettes from our practices, or even some shows. It was called Five Live, actually. So it was some shows that we were playing in lofts around downtown New York. And uh, we gave him the tape and then went back to see him. And he's, he's going, I'd like to see these guys live. And, he, and we're like, could you get us a gig? And he got us a gig. Uh, at Tier 3, which was in Tribeca, and he just became our manager, our producer, our friend, our, our you know, our, 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 our Uncle Ed, you know, he, he guided us along. And yes. He believed in us. Excellent. Tier 3. Um, yeah. Was that Anne Magnuson? I can't remember her No, name. no, it wasn't Anne Magnuson. Um, don't ask me. Very lovely woman. Hillary is the name. I yes. remember her last name. So can but you it was remember? really cool. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, can what was Tier Three like as a venue? Because I know the sort of there's CBGBs and there's Max's Kansas City and then the Mud Club, but Tier Three I haven't come across quite Very so different. much. Very different because um, it was more like, you know, like Mud Club was you know its own thing and it was very special and they're all very special. But you know, Mud Club had it had its like you know fashion not fashion thing but like its hipster you know trendy kind of thing going. But it was still like accessible to anybody if you came proper yes um cbgb's was cbg's classic you know whatever whatever um max is you know was old school but tier three was more like a, a bar that had a room a live room right next to the bar and um you know it was just more down to earth and working class than in any of those other places well cbg's was working class but at that point it had such you know, cachet that it was a whole on a whole different level. But um, yeah, tier three didn't last very long. And the last night of uh, it in 1980, it was ESG, us and Dog Eat Dog, which who were friends of ours, who didn't put out a record back in the day. It was like three women, um, friends of ours. And uh, in, do you know Claremont 56? Paul no. Murphy, Mud. He's, he's, he's based in London. He has a record label, Claremont 56. He released like in uh, 2013 or something, their first record, their only record. Oh. So we, we, play, we played with them that last night, you know, ESG, Liquid Liquid and, and Doggy Dog. Special. Amazing. What was the typical audience? What was the typical fan of the band? What were they like? How could you describe them? I was just kind of curious. It wasn't, it wasn't typical. Like I said, we were just really way into what we were doing and what we were doing wasn't referencing, refer, referencing much except itself, even though we had tons of influences, but our influences were 
I, I, you know, as, I think as opposed to a lot of people who are influenced by a lot of things, our influences I felt were well digested, almost to the point where you couldn't recognize them. And so it would just take, you know, it wasn't like people who dressed like this or people had this kind of attitude like this. It was just this per, a, a type of person who could see the value in what we were doing, you know. So that's it was very much liquid, liquid. In, in, in the first round was very self-contained, you know. I mean, we would go out, we would practice, you know, eat dinner and go out, you know, watch Johnny Carson's monologue and then go to one of the mud club or whatever. Yeah. And tier three. And uh, we would also play at these places. And the, a good thing about Ed, Ed Bauman, is it seemed whenever a, a new venue opened, no matter how long it, it lasted, we always played there in the first month. He'd always get us a gig. So we were getting pretty seasoned and, and you know, just playing a lot. And um, But it wasn't until the third record, it wasn't until Cavern and then uh, Grandmaster Flash, you know, nicking uh, white lines that, we really start, you know, started to be known. And did you create in the music? Did you do it in a form of like sitting there sort of coming up with ideas or did you go together in a sort of practice room and try and sort of bash out kind of a, a kind of a rhythm on a few vocals? I mean, what was that process for you guys? It, it was totally, it was totally organic. Firstly, we had that, that place that they moved into after when first coming to New York, which was on West 80th Street in Columbus, which is a really kind of Tony area right now. But uh, back then, we, I don't know how we got away with this. We were practicing. We lived on the fifth floor of a five floor walk up. We would practice in the living room. I slept with my head in the bass drum, you know. So um, so we would just like, you know, yeah, we would just uh, play, do you know, record it on cassette go over it, say, hey, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Let's try to repeat that idea. Sometimes the song didn't come together until we actually went into the studio. And um, yeah, so there would, it would be like someone writing, you know, a parts in their, you know, li- uh, you know, home, you know, bedroom or something and come in and say, hey, I got you do this, you do this, you do this. And we're just like, let's just play. And if we come up with a good idea, we keep playing it until it's formed into something. Yes. And can you remember this sort of your, your you know, this sort of studio session for your first EP, which came out, which has got, he has got the group me, group me, then it finishes on the B side, it's got um, Bellhead. Was that all done in, in one sort of short period of time, those five tracks? Well, Bellhead, Bellhead was live, as was um, New Walk on that record, the second track on the first side. Um, group me, group was was the first song we recorded and i think it, that was recorded on a track and um yeah i have another story you know when so group me group wasn't it was just the groove when we went to record it and everybody did their parts and i was last and you know i um you know i was just dying to do my vocal track and that was the last thing and i you know got a little happy and went into the vocal booth and did it. And, you know, I just killed it. And everybody was like clapping. And it was like, uh, and remember, this is all improvised. The engineer was like, "Uh, I'm sorry. You know, everybody was like, yeah, pat me on the back. I'm sorry, Sal, we didn't get that. And then I had to go and do it again. And I I thought what I did was like one third of what I originally done, but like, I guess it doesn't matter because it's just what it is, you know? And but it was funny that that's how fragile, I guess, our approach was back then. And even Cavern from the Optimal EP, that was part of a, like a 14 minute jam that we just, you know, took, uh, you know, a certain amount of parts, you know, five, four or five minutes at, out of it and made the song. Yes, because that that that's amazing. That's your that's on that. That's your third EP at this stage. Were you kind of as a band? slightly frustrated not to get more material kind of recorded and sort of you know most be- people you know they have that you know 12 month honeymoon period recording or rehearsing they get the first single and then qu- you know if that gets a bit of traction it's like right let's get the album out and let's get the tour i mean this is very much like in the uk but you were sort of doing one in one sort of um you know, at that point there was kind of one ep a year almost wasn't it up to the the yeah, um, your much. classic did you were you kind of as as a band sort of frustrated not to get more kind of things recorded 
Mm, I, I, you know, I don't remember it actually being an issue because what we put out, we wanted it to be great, you know, so we didn't want to just put out something. And also, I guess we were um, insistent upon putting out where we were at right in the moment because we had we had a lot of old like older material that never got recorded but for some reason we didn't really revisit that you know we wouldn't say well let's get a good studio recording of this thing and this thing i mean we eventually put it out in different forms and um yes but uh yeah i think we we just wanted to represent what we where we were at in the moment and not you know not try to just put out a, a lot of stuff and throw, you know, spaghetti at the wall, whatever sticks, you know, we want, we wanted to really represent where, what we wanted and what, where we were at. Yes. So with the, your third EP, was this, do you look at that now as a sort of a really high point of the band? Had Was this where you felt like the stars had lined up and you're thinking, right, we've really got something special here? Well, and also because we recorded at the top floor of Radio City Music Hall, which used to be NBC Studios, um, where they would record the old school radio shows. So there was all these props in there, but the engineer was just amazing. And you know, you know, it was it was a really good studio. Pretty much state of the art at the time, which was state of the art was like you had an engineer who could splice tape and put it back together and do it in really quick and a really efficient manner. So um, and also we were ripe, you know. I mean, we were getting really ripe and you know, starting. I mean. Uh, you know, I, I I wasn't a musician. I, even after all these years, I don't consider myself a musician. I consider myself a musical performer. Mm -hmm. You know, even even currently with my current project, I'm playing drums and I'm kind of, and it's again, we call it unprepared music. So it's improvised. And I'm not trying to sound like a drummer. I'm just trying to play percussion, make sounds, make, make a joyful sound, you know. And, you know, so we were, I was never uh, obsessed with being a musician. So we we're just, we were just kind of coming on our own. I mean, Scotty, the drummer, and Dennis, the uh, Murma percussion, they were proper musicians, but me and Richard were just naive musicians. Yes, and amazing. I mean, how, I mean, I'm sure this is kind of one of those questions, isn't it? But how was, how did you cope when you found, you know, Grandmaster Flash had so heavily sampled that track? Did that, was that kind of a difficult experience for the band to navigate through all that kind of legality and issues? Woof. Uh, yeah, it was more confusing than difficult. I mean, of course, all the legal stuff and what, what came to be later on. But I first found out about it. So right before White Lines was, um, you know, uh, it's like a jungle sometimes. You know, uh, you know uh, that was a huge track that kind of changed the face of hip hop. Yes. And so, and so Grandmaster Flash was at their pinnacle. And then they used to have free concerts on Sundays in Tompkins Square Park. And I went to one and someone um, comes up to me and goes, hey, have you heard the new Grandmaster Flash track? It sounds like Liquid Liquid. And I'm like, what in, what in the world does that mean? You know, because we used to make jokes about people trying to do cover versions of our, our music, you know, like, uh, you know, it's just so odd and quirky, no one, you know. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And then I heard and I was like, yeah, it definitely does sound like Cavern. And, um, you know, I mean, it really raised our star quite a, quite a bit. So that was good. You know, uh, you know, we did all these gigs like the at the Paradise Garage at uh, I don't know if it's directly because of White Lines, but like, you know, Cavern in itself was a hit in the clubs. Like Larry Levan would play Cavern, and and the uh, you know um, WBLS would play it on the radio. Uh, so we had we had a we had a hit a minor hit on our own, but then when White Lines came along, that kind of blew it all out of the water. But then we did just the so, Sorry. No. Um. And then we went on to do all these disco gigs where we would just play two songs at a disco tech night, like Paradise Garage, The Roxy, um, you know, all these places, Club Zanzibar in Newark, New Jersey, with Tony Humphreys. Uh, so that was good. I mean, it was exciting. I mean, we should have just, we didn't keep on going. You know, that was the big problem. We had a, a lot more to to say and to to give, um, you know, but 
things just stopped after a while. And the whole pressure of the Grandmaster Flash legal thing, it sunk 99 Records. And once 99 Records sunk, it, it was over. Yes, I could imagine that was very tricky. Um, a bit like my microphone, actually. I'm just going to try and see if I can do something. That just... Can we take a break? I'd like to just, can we take a break? Yeah, let's do that. But I'd love to go, just have a quick... Right, that why. Yeah, so so then does that sink the record label at this stage, you know, nine you know, all the, the issues with Grandmaster Flash? Yeah, supposedly, you know, um we were kind of in the dark about a lot of the stuff. Like we weren't following it, you know, the legal stuff. That was just Ed and he was taking care of it, but it got kind of crazy. So there was this fanzine out of North Carolina, I believe, called Tuba Frenzy. And in 1997, they wrote the history of 99 Records, or 99 Records, however you want to pronounce it. And I learned so much from that article that I didn't know, you know. And I can confirm that it's all true, um, but, you know, a lot of it makes a lot of sense. And according to this article, we had, and I don't know why, I don't know what we knew, um, I don't remember that well, but there was supposedly this huge settlement with Sugar Hill, but they went bankrupt and they didn't pay and had uh, racked up all these legal bills. And so that's kind of what sunk. I, I can't, I can't confirm that, that, but that's what this article said. And, you know, I, I like at a certain point, it was just, you know, such an emotional thing. It was it's painful in a lot of ways that we didn't keep going and, and, you know, get to where we needed to be that I just kind of walked away from, you know, the whole experience thing. This is going to be a footnote to my life. But who knew that like 30, 40 years later, it's, it's more, you know, it has, it's more regarded than, than ever, you know? So that's an interesting thing. But um, back then, you know, I was still youngish, you know, whatever, 27. So, you know, I was, I didn't sweat things, you know, I didn't want to look back. I just wanted to look forward because there was so much I wanted to do. And I, I did keep going, making music, you know, keep, you know, reading, keep doing things, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was hard, though. Yeah, I mean, because there was Z Records as well at that stage, which was, was that from somebody from this part of the world and not really part of that scene? Were those two record labels the record labels of New York at that time? Z. Well, there was a lot of record labels, like you know, I, I, which I don't want to like try to remember them all. But you know, um, Fourth and Broadway, there was a lot of hip hop labels are coming along. Disco, all the disco. Labels. I mean, underground New York, you know, post punk, whatever you want to call it, punk funk. Yeah, those were the you know two main ones. And do you and, and on that on that sort of side of of the band, do you now own your music? Does do you as Liquid Liquid own, you know, the masters and have the you know publishing? Uh, you and, know, like it, it's just a multi layer bean dip that I don't really want to go <laughs> into at all. You know, I don't want to talk about anything legal. You know? Yeah, no, God, no, absolutely, no. I no, I was just kind of curious because because obviously I've been doing lots of these interviews with people, and it's kind of like, oh yes, our we you know like. Like I was saying, I did an interview with a guy from that Petrol Emotion and, you know, they've now got their kind of music and some people have and some people haven't. And they're in that kind of process. And it's all kind of kind of all very complicated, slightly complicated at times. I just kind of was curious if if you went, yeah, now we now we whatever, we've got to a better place. But anyway, that's fine. I don't want to get into any odd sort of um, trickiness anyway. So then, yeah, so you know, and whatever happens to like you can't you're not supposed to talk about it. and i mean that's part of any settlement is that you can't talk about it you know, good idea yes it. let's not and um so then what do you do then sort of from 83 kind of onwards because obviously this massive part of your life has kind of finished do you then find other creative kind of outlets to start working in all right let me just i'll give you a brief biography so somewhere when liquid liquid was still playing there was a um, a guy who was a part of Alercus Magnus and played a little bit with the early Liquid Liquid, Ken Man Caldera, who's now a climate scientist, brilliant guy out of Stanford University. And we started playing, we got a rehearsal space. I don't know, I don't know how it, it just evolved. The doggy dog had a rehearsal space and they needed us, someone to, to help them pay the rent. So we went down there and we started a project called Fist the Facts. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we put out an EP. So when I was doing that, I started like at once the liquids kind of puttered out. I started doing that. We started doing that a lot. We put out the record. We traveled around a bit. We traveled to Europe. Um, you know, it, it was it kept me busy. It was good. It evolved from being, you know, kind of a live thing. I mean, Ken Man, we call him. Ken Calderas is a real man, but he's known as Ken Man to us. Like in 1985, he brought down to this rehearsal space an IBM AT with a half a megabyte of RAM and Voyatra sequencing software. And it's the first time I saw such a thing, you know, where you can make music on a computer. And he was a real whiz. So we started making uh, MIDI stuff connected to a TAC4 track. And we made a lot of music that way, you know. And uh, eventually a Swiss label put out an EP. We, we, you know, we had a demo. They heard the demo. They wanted to put out an EP. But of course, we went to do a proper recording. And it wasn't as magical as, as the four track was. But, you know, it was pretty good. And we did that until like 91 when uh, Ken Mann left New York to go to Stanford. And that was that. And then really quickly, during the 90s, I started, you know, like I started during Fist of Facts. It was like, I'd go for gigs and I'd get a gig and we'd be playing with, you know, like a, you know, a one, one band on a three band bill and the other two bands had nothing to do with us. So I would be like, can I book the band before us? And they said, yeah. And then I'd be, can I book the band after us? Can I book the whole night? And I started promoting, you know, shows. And um, after Ken Man left, I just pretty much promoted shows for a while. Like I had this thing called the Sunset Series before the Hudson River Park was developed. Now it's like in landscaped and corporate and everything. But it was just a rundown place where, you know, people would just go to hang out. And I started doing shows on the old piers on the Hudson River. And it was more like a very eclectic, you know, spoken word, uh, music, you know, maybe films, dance, you know, very much international. I wasn't just like, you know, it wasn't just New Yorkers or anything. I was, a lot of African music, a lot of Caribbean music. And um, after doing that a while and people starting to get a reputation, there was a guy who was doing an, a reggae night. And it was actually next, next door to my apartment building on Sullivan Street in Greenwich Village. And he's gone, so, so, so. He's, he was from Ghana. He goes, let's do African reggae uh, night. So on Sunday nights, we would do early African music and uh, Caribbean roots. And then the sound, uh, sound system, reggae sound system later on at night. And that went on for years. And that was really, really fun. And it was, you know, it was just great. And then in the aughts, <laughs> tell me if I'm just going on too much. No, no, that's good. It's good. No, no. And then in the aughts, there seemed to be a revival, you know, uh, in, in downtown New York and, and in general of a recognition of what we were doing. LCD sound system, uh, you know, uh, being being um, DFA, being a perfect example, being name checked all the time. Yeah. And uh, then we got together on a, a lark. In like 2002, Scotty was living in rural New Jersey, some barn, you know, or whatever. And um, on a lark, he says, let's get together and just see where we're at with the material. So we hadn't played together in like 18, 19 years. And it was so intact that, I mean, it wasn't perfectly tight, but the, the foundation of it was so intact. It was almost laughable. We were like giddy because I, I can't believe how good this is, you know. And so next time someone offers us a gig, we'll take it, which was in March of uh, 2003, I think. Yeah, 2003 at the Knitting Factory in Tribeca. And we didn't know what to, to expect. And it went really well. And then we played for a couple of years. And then we had one or two bad gigs. And once we have one or two bad gigs, it's over, it's over, it's over. We're washed up. We can't do this anymore. And then just to go on a little bit more, uh, in 2008, you know, we hook up, hooked up with Domino. And they put a, a did a reissue, and then we did a bunch of shows. Uh, we played at the Barbican in, in like 2008, which is really ironic because it was October 2008. You know what was happening in October 2008? Financial collapse, and we're playing the Barbican, and everything's going great. And you know, um, and then we played a bunch of gigs until Madison Square Garden uh, opening for LCD in 2011, and that was it. And we haven't played since then. Now, in between, too, just to ramble on, 
I got into food. I would be giving like these cooking lesson dinner parties in my apartment, my little apartment. And I would do pop up, uh, um, pop up restaurant things. And, you know, started a, you know, a, a, a website of singing with my mouth full of cooking and, and music and, you know, uh, yeah. So I, I kept going, you know, I kept doing things. Yes, absolutely. My God, that's kind of amazing. So wait, so, I, so I was going to say with the band at the moment, then it's kind of since 2008, it has just been put on pause. Is there any kind of potential to 2011. do anything? 2011. Is there any um, idea of possibly doing anything kind of in the future, you know, with, with the lineup or is it just pretty there, much? Put- there's, there's, you know, there's always a possibility, you know, the older you get, I guess the harder it gets because we just become ourselves so much more, you know, but we're all healthy. We're all still around. We're probably all better musicians than we have ever been. So we have to see, but you know, you can't, you know, you just can't push these things, you know, when it's time, if it's time, then we'll do it. If not, that's okay too. You know, um, I just think, you know, I, I think you should be generous in spirit when it comes to your art. You know, if you could do it, probably you should do it. You know, because you might touch somebody who would not necessarily be touched with you if you've never done anything else. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, you should be generous with your artistic spirit, but you shouldn't push it too hard. You know, you shouldn't be desperate to do it. You shouldn't be like, I have to, we have to do this. You only do it if, if the stars align, like I think you said before. And it has in the past, and maybe it will in the future. But yeah. in the meantime, you know, I'm, I'm really loving the project. I, it's called 178 Product. And it it um came out of these sessions we were doing. I had a had a, a, a rehearsal space for 27 years underneath the Max Fish Bar on Lower Street in the East, uh, Lower East Side, and we just had these sessions and you know just evolved into this unprepared music thing. It, it started you know it was a 13 piece band at one point. Now we're down to like four or five, and we kind of during the pandemic we kind of laid low. We really didn't get together that much. Now. I'm feeling strong and I'm really loving my drumming. And I think it's really unique. I mean, even though it's limited, I just do what I know how to do. But um, everybody else is just really getting good at like, you know, following along and getting with the spirit, which is very open, open and and, and not terse and hard. Well, it gets a little hard sometimes, but, it's, you know, it's pump funky, a little jazzy, a little, um, you know, Afro beady, whatever. And, you know, it's just, again, it's its own thing. So I'm very proud of it. And I really like the way it's going. And I feel really empowered as a musician these days. Yes, absolutely. It sounds fantastic. I was just kind of also curious because it is, you know, nearly 40 years ago when you had the band. And I noticed that quite a few of your, you know, the people on that scene have either reformed and are doing dates or they've done, you know, been putting out their kind of box set collections or some people are making films about what they have done. And there's a British band called Rima Rima who seemed very arty at the time and they've just had a film made about them even though they only lasted like 12 months but I just kind of was curious if you were also wow. feeling like there's there's kind of feeling of kind of reevaluating what you've done through you know through that period. yeah there is there definitely is uh again you know it's too soon to talk about things you know it's just you know but we are reevaluating reevaluating everything um and we've done recording sessions. We did a recording session with DFA in 2004, but it was too soon after we got together again. So I, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard this stuff. Actually, I do have it somewhere, but um, we just didn't feel, I mean, one thing Bell had, you know, that um, Tim Goldsworthy we totally took apart because we, we did, it's just a percussion song, but he put it, took it totally apart and put it in the grid and, put it out on DFA compilation number two, which just actually came out in vinyl for the first time. Very, very beautiful packaging. And it's a great, it's a great version of Bellhead, totally different than the original. And Alvin Ailey, I don't know if you know the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. They're mm-hmm. a 50, like a 50 year old um, dance, African-American dance company in New York, based in New York. And they were, they used it in one of their pieces. And it was just at a, at a Lincoln Center. And it was just fabulous, you know, it was just amazing. So, um, yeah, we're constantly evaluating things and, you know, uh, you know, stay tuned, stay tuned. But like, if not, if nothing else happens, that's fine too. You know, I mean, like I said, we had our moments, you know, it's fun when it's fun, but if, you know, if it ain't going to be fun 
or it ain't a good look, my bother. Yes, this is true. This is all very true. So basically, but what you're saying that you've got a, a the musical combo, is it one seven eight product you said is your latest mm-hmm. music? musical mm-hmm. and, and are you more... and are you putting live dates are you putting any recordings in the studio well releases? what is ironic we, we have one digital release um that came out a, a few years back um the, the ironic thing so now the guy who runs the rehearsal space it's in Gowanus in brooklyn uh called king killer uh the guy who runs it has it wired for eight track recording and since we're we don't play anything twice, we're getting all these recordings. Every every we practice on Sunday nights. Every Sunday night, mostly, um, we record the sessions. So we have like hours and hours of eight track recording that we obviously we could overdub. And um, you know, we're just 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 starting to like uh, you know try to produce stuff again. And my production skills aren't where they need to be, which you know I'm not proud of. And I could move things a lot faster along if I could like just work by myself. And I kind of know logic and whatever. But like, you know, like I one thing I like to work with people, you know, I'd like to cl- bounce off of people. I don't, you know, there is one of Elliot, you know, his uh, stage name is Ulysses. He, he, you know, produces up some of the tracks on his own. But I wanted to be doing overdubs and stuff. And I don't know whether we should do the overdubs before anybody touches it. You know, we're still working out the, you know, the approach to, getting things out but we have a lot a lot of material not all of it's good of course but when we have those moments they're you know they i get so happy they make me so high you know in, in a natural kind of way but, yes um, when it's good it's it's really good in our live we only played one live show since the pandemic and that was at this place called mama tried and sunset park in uh i think it's sunset park the neighborhood of brooklyn and it was an indoor outdoor space it was june 30th I got this um, Mama do this African, I said West African, you know, player talking drum player to headline because I, you know, I, I don't even feel I'm not even feeling like we should be headlining. We should just be supporting act until we really get really really strong. But it was a great gig, and it was, you know, it's just so much fun playing live, you know. And I hope to do more. But you know, with the pandemic and things, you know, I, I like I'm not in any big hurry. You know, I've had I have a career of over forty years, and we'll take things as they come. Yes, absolutely. And just because because you mentioned you know your the, your father at the beginning, did, did was that kind of relationship? Did that improve over the decades? And and sort of you came to oh. understand each other a bit better. Oh yes, of course. I mean, things changed like when he first, you know. Um, <laughs> well, it's funny because my mother was always a big supporter. She, you know, she'd be playing like you know um, the first EP to we're friends you know and you know and they're like what what is it and my grandmother at the time said uh it sounds like a a bunch of people in the basement doing drugs and I was like grandma how did you figure that one out (laughs) um but uh no like you know we were on this there was this locally produced show called two two on a town and we play at the old peppermint lounge and so we were on tv once they see you're on tv then you know a light bulb lights up and what was really good and thank God, because my mother died when she was really young, like in 1984. Like in 1983, they came to Danceteria, the club Danceteria, to see us play. And they just had this fantastic time. And they were just like, whoa, <laughs> this is something really special. You know, they they saw it. And, and you know, my, um, so yeah, then my mother died. And, you know, I, and then my brother died. My only brother died. So yeah, I got really close. And, you know, he moved to Florida, the Gulf Coast of Florida. And, you know, I'd go see him for a couple of days. We'd watch The Godfather on, on repeat and make a bowl of pasta for Zool and drink beers and wine. And, you know, as long as we didn't talk politics, we got along great. And he would really be always asking me about, how's it going? How's it going? And when I says, uh, one of the guys doesn't want to do liquid, liquid, he goes, son, of you know, he'd get really angry. Like, what? That's crazy. You know, you should be doing your thing, you know? So, yeah, the, the relationship, you know, completely changed after a while. But, you know. We had a, we had our just you know politics was our main disagreement I would say <laughs> tricky one yeah so if you could have said something to your like sixteen year old self starting out you could have just whispered something in their ear with all the decades and experience and wisdom that you might have uh, developed is there anything in particular that you might have wanted to say yeah I'll just tell you this well, kid that's, that's a very very interesting question 
because I somehow feel that I'm on the same trajectory as that 15, 16, 16, let's say 16 year old kid when I really started getting going. So I don't really look at myself as a different, you know, person. And what I needed to do, I've done, you know, I've become comfortable in my, I, I, I was, just, you know, but I kind of like, I mean, the only thing that I was not good at is being comfortable in my own skin. You know, I was still very much, uh, you know, uh, groping for where to define myself. But I always believed in myself, and I, you know, and I, I always kept going. I never stopped going. But I, I like, I didn't have to tell my sixteen-year-old self that because I knew that that's what I was going to do. But, um, you know, I just, I don't want to use a, the cliche, but it's a beautiful cliche. You know, it just always gets better. You know, I mean, like, you know, knock on wood. Um, you know, I, I just feel more comfortable in my skin. I feel. Uh, smarter, more patient, more understanding, more giving, more grounded, more centered. And that's all that's I, I wasn't that when I was young, but I that, that's what I uh, was going for. And I kind of knew what I had to do to get it, you know, be artistically vital, educate yourself, um, you know, just uh, and work on your character, you know, just keep becoming a better and better person. And that's the way you do that on every level is not to be self-indulgent, not to say uh, I, I'm not self-indulgent or I will continue being a little bit self-indulgent, but, um, you know, live, you know, live for what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to feel, you know, and, you know, that's it. And I, I was, I've been on this trajectory for 45, even longer, and maybe almost 50 years now, I just turned 65. So yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't now have, would have much to say to my sixteen-year-old self. I, I would just, I probably the sixteen-year-old self would probably have something to say to my sixty-five-year-old self more than vice versa. <laughs> this is true. This is amazing. Well, look, this is amazing. Oh yeah, just to so I don't mess this up. How do you pre- What's the best? Um, what's your? What's the best way to pronounce your name? And which bit do you pronounce? And which bit don't you? Uh, so, uh, in plain English. Well, I'm saying in Italian, Salvatore Principato, but that's that's in Italian. I n- never use that, you know. I mean, because I'm in, uh, in the state, in plain American English, it's Salvatore Principato, and I do use Salvatore if people don't know me or if it's in a business sense. But basically, if you, I have any kind of relationship with you on whatever level, you call me Sal or Sal P, you know, like when I DJ, I DJ a Sal P. Right. Or I always say you, you can call me anything as long as it's affectionately. It's like good. My it's partner good... calls my partner calls me Farty. You could call me that too, <laughs> as long as it's affectionately. <laughs> yes. No. That's. I, I think that's you know that's between you and your partner. But no, yeah, I'll call you Sal P. She would say that. <laughs> yeah. All these things happen, don't they? We get to an age, don't we? Where, yes, we. It's all. It's all about it. Yeah. Um, explorations of the nether regions or anything but anyway look this has been amazing thank you well, ever so much you know, for this can i just Oops. say something you know, you're talking about getting older that's a that's a, a real pitfall about people getting older they stop kind of giving an ass you know about you know how they present themselves or you know what they say or you know like you know they just stop you know care like caring like it doesn't matter at this point and it's always got to matter. And you're, and that's what I mean about building character. As long as it's matter, it matters you build character. Yes, I agree. No, it's, it's, a, it's a good one. I think, actually, if you take your health really seriously and you take your diet seriously and you do exercise on most days, I think that really helps keep it going because because through that you sort of you get better habits you cut out things that aren't so good for you you know you you definitely need to catch up with some good sleep and sometimes during the day a little bit of a moment to just re you know to to regroup again but i do think that trying to sort of keep the body going is is incredibly important and quite a holistic experience that's my theory anyway well the, yeah it's the funny the thing is uh, like i'm not proud of it but i barely work out but I lead a very physical life. I put the maximum amount of physical energy into anything I do. And it's almost like I'm working out by just living life. And things like I love to cook. Cooking is like my meditation. Like I kick 
you know, sorry, I take Anastasia out of the kitchen, you know, it's like, I need to cook because that centers me and that's my meditation, you know? And yeah, so, um, you know, a certain, you just, you know, a certain amount of physical vitality. I mean, I guess it's good to go on the treadmill and whatever, go running, but um, I don't think it's absolutely necessary as long as you live a very physical life and playing music is physical, cooking is physical, running up and down stairs is physical. It's all physical, you know, yes. just put your maximum amount of physical energy into what you're doing. And I think you'll be in good, pretty good shape. And I, you know, up to this point, I'm in pretty good shape. I feel good. Let's hope that continues. Yes, absolutely. Well, look, thank you ever so much. Look, have an amazing midwinter and Christmas and New Year. And thank you again for this. Yeah. And if you want, I can always send you the link and you can always use it elsewhere. Oh, well, if I want. <laughs> I a... insist. Yes, sir. Kind <laughs> sir. No, and that'll be did, great. They call you David, Dave or David? David, yes. I'm always been a David. So, um, but, you know, I'm not that fast. But... Beautiful thing. David's good. But anyway, look, thank you ever so much. Right, David. You've been amazing. Thank you again and have a lovely day. And I'm going to go to bed. So there you go. Okay. Take yeah, care. There. Yeah. See oh, you later. Right there. Sorry. No, to bye. Bye, bye bye. And that was me in conversation with Sal Principato to find out um, from Liquid Liquid. So there you go. That's the end of the interview. Hopefully that was exciting and interesting with uh, not too many quality issues. I know, never mind. Um, C86 Show. If you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just do C86 Show. You'll find me somewhere there. And all these have been archived on Spotify, iTunes and Podbeam. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe. <laughs>